Good morning, everyone. Hallelujah. Yeah, it is, um, it's been a wonderful journey, our relationship and how the Lord put us together. Like you said, we don't have time to go into all of that, but uh, I tell you, it's much better when God does it, when he puts us together. He has a plan for all of us. It's always a good plan, never for evil. Amen. We, um, <clears throat> I'm just going to introduce us a little bit and then turn over my wife, so I'm going to take my opportunity right now to say a few things because I might not get, might not get the mic back here, but uh, <laughs> no, we, uh, we co-pastor, and I know that if that challenges some of you in here, thinking that a woman can be a pastor, I kind of doubt it since Pastor Karen and Pastor Monica are here, but nonetheless, uh, we'll pray for you that God will open the eyes of your understanding, okay? We make no apologies. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But, um, you know, we have had a, a wonderful time of ministry going on, what, 24 years now, so we're, we're pups compared to Pastor John and Karen as far as length of time, but um, we've learned some things, and that's good. You know, we ought to be learning as we go, go forward in the things of God. And <clears throat> one of the areas that God seems to uh, use us in, and we've experienced in our own lives in a, uh, a wonderful way, is increase in the area of financial prosperity. And you say, well, yeah, you shared on that one other time. Well, you know, if that, that's part of the niche that God has given you, and I make no apologies for that. I make no apologies for that. Um, you know, not that we ha have learned everything or know everything and have arrived. That's not the case at all. We're always learning. But uh, I can look back and see how God has used us not only to experience that in our own lives, but also minister truths to others that can set them free in the same area. And so we're going to minister along these lines this morning. You know, there's, there's different levels of um, blessing, different levels of uh, uh, increase, maybe is another way you could say it. You think about Philippians 4, verse 19, we kind of all know that verse, don't we? My God shall supply all your need, all my need, all of our need, according to his riches and glory by and through Christ Jesus. And that's, that's good, and that's wonderful, but that's kind of one level. You know, it's good to have your needs met. It's good to have your bills paid. It's good to have, uh, you know, not, not be short and having to carry a bill over to the next month because you don't have enough to pay it this month. Having your needs met, that's good. But then there's a verse over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that says that, that we can have an abundance that's another level, an abundance for every good work. Can you guys display Amplified back there? Do you have that capability? The Amplified Bible? I'll, I'll just read you this verse here in 2 Corinthians 9. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful promise. And I want to read it to you out of the Amplified Bible because of, of course, the way it says it here. But um, let me get it opened up here. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8. Now listen to this. God is able to make... All grace, and then the definition of grace in this application, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance. That's another level, folks. Every favor and earthly blessing in abundance. See, that's more than enough. You know, we, you probably all heard this, and it does, it does preach good, but the Israelites came out of Egypt into the wilderness, which was a land of just enough, but God wanted to get them into the promised land, a land that was more than enough, a land flowing with milk and honey. If that was, yeah. That's right. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. That's I'm talking right. about you bringing in the souls of your family right now. Yeah, yeah. That's I'm right. I'm talking about your health and your healing. When we talk about harvesting, I mean, that, 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 that's an arena all its own. I mean, everybody, how many of you got some dreams out there? God gave you those dreams, and he gave you those dreams for a reason. He wants you to have them. Amen. So, yeah, I know there are some people when they hear the word finance, they automatically turn you off. But let me tell you something. I've been poor. 
Yeah. Rich is better. I would tell you, yeah. I've been poor, and you would say, how poor is poor? Poor is where we used to go to the cow barn, and we used to buy a case of eggs. And I can show you more ways to cook eggs because we couldn't afford meat. I can tell you, we used to have to spend 10 bucks, and that would have to last us three weeks, and we had three sons, and we had to drive back and forth to work. Let me tell you something. That is a curse. That's right. Yes, we got by, but we sure weren't thriving. And I don't mean this wrong, please. I know this is what it's going to sound like. But we were not really as frugal with this money. A lot of people would be. You don't go to the guy that says, please give me food. I'll work at least this time. I'm going to show you how to get ready to work. But come on, they got the sign. Are you really going to go to them and get your next stock tip? Are you going to ask them which mutual fund to invest in, which business you ought to buy? No. So I don't mean it wrong. Why are they coming to you and wanting to know all the good things that God has if they're not seeing it flowing out of your life? If they're not seeing your family coming in, they're not seeing you walk in divine freedom. They're not seeing you walk in peace. They're not seeing you walk in victory. I don't mean it wrong. We are to be the head and not the tail and above only not the end. See what I'm talking about? I didn't even get to finish the verse. See what I'm talking about? All right. <laughs> I was saying every favor and earthly blessing will come to us, how? In abundance. In abundance. Now listen to the rest of this. So that you may always, everyone say always. That means all the time, right? That you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient not requiring aid or support, but rather possessing enough and be furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. That's an excellent verse of promise, amen? Hallelujah. So there's that, that place. There's that place, but as my wife was saying, I think sometimes we get content. Okay, my needs are met. My bills are paid. This is good. I, I, I can camp out right here and stay right here because, that, after all, that's all God. God never, never promised to meet our wants, just our needs. Well, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. That's Old Testament, folks. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Another uh, translation says lack. In other words, I, I don't have to suffer lack. You know, I, I've shared this before, you know, that have, we've had abundance from really about 1997. That's when we were believing for and became debt-free. It is possible to live debt-free in today's economy, in today's world. It is possible. Uh, we've got two of our three sons that, that are practicing faith principles and, and in the Word of God strongly. The other one, we're believing that he will come into the fullness of what he was raised up in and knows, but uh, right now he's, he's uh, not quite in that place, but we're believing that he will walk in that. Yeah. 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 But, but listen, and I, I don't say this in any way. If you think this sounds like brag, then it's because I'm boasting on God and God alone. It's because of him. It's not anything we've done other than just try to, as Pastor John and Karen say, pray and obey. Pray and obey. Get the revelation, then walk it out. Be a hearer and a doer of the Word of God. And I know you say, well, I want to hear something inspirational. Folks, I'm telling you what, we can't leave some of these things that are, that are basics, things that we know and yet we've let slip, and I think we've done a, a disservice to younger generations because we've heard some things, we've practiced some things, it's working in our lives, but let's go on to something new, a new key. Folks, these old keys are still working. We got the keys to the kingdom, Jesus gave us, but we got to work the key. You got to turn the key. Sticking the key, holding the key, putting it in the, the, the door, the, the lock on the door doesn't do anything until you turn the key, until you put forth some action. We've got to be doers of the word. Doers of the word. You want to know the key that's going to win? The one who practices the basics. Is uh -huh. that not true, yeah. Honor? Yeah. It's not got to get back to basics. The new little play, the new little twist that we're going to have about the quarterback running out and him catching the pass instead of throwing it. Come on, it's going to be, can you block? Come on, yeah. can, you, can you carry out the fundamentals of what is right? Yeah. And that's what's good. We're looking for this fancy little key. That's we're right. We're looking for something fancy. Say, be a doer. Yep, be a doer of the word. Of the word. Yeah. It works, amen. Yeah. And it says not a hearer only, 
deceiving yourself. If you just hear it, think, man, I got it. But you don't put it into action, you have deceived yourself. You think, I got it. It's not doing a thing for you. You've got to put it into practice. You've got to put it into practice. Go to Genesis, and put this up in the King James Version. Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30. I just heard my wife say, uh. <laughs> she thinks I'm going to take off and preach for a while. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, overrunning. We don't want to do that. No. How, how many have ever been in a marathon church service? In other words, you felt like when you got through, we just ran a marathon. We're not after that. We're not, no, we're just going to be. As Pastor John said, this is the Holy Spirit service. We're going to let him lead. And so we're endeavoring. Just pray and agree with us that we hear his voice clearly and we, we say no more, no less than what he once said. Amen. Look here in the last verse of Genesis 30. This is referring to Jacob. It says, and the, this is verse 43. Genesis 30, 43. And the man increased exceedingly. Everyone say exceedingly. In other words, how many would say that sounds like abundance? Increased exceedingly and had much cattle and maid servants and men serv servants and camels and donkeys. Okay? Now, go to chapter 31 and the first verse. Again, our Bibles weren't written in chapter and verse. Verse 1 of 31 begins with the word and. That's, that's connecting it to the previous verse. And he heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this. What's the word? You read in the King James Bible, what's it say? All this glory. Glory. You realize that's the first time the word glory, Hebrew kabod, was used in our Bible? Now, I'm not saying that's the first time the glory of God was manifest. That's the first time you see the word used, though. Now, if you have a New King James or a more contemporary version, you're going to see that it uses the word wealth. Has he gotten all this wealth? Because one manifestation of the glory of God is wealth. Come on, folks. Let's not be ashamed of it. Let's not, well, I don't want to talk about money. No one wants to hear about that. And I know sometimes people get tired of hearing about it. And, and I even hear people say, we don't want money. We don't want things. We just want you, Jesus. Then quit your job. Volunteer all your time to the church or missions or whatever if you don't want any money, you don't want any things. Now, that sounds religious and it sounds pious, but it's, um, it's not true. See, and God doesn't want it. Does he want us just eking out an existence down here, just, just barely making or maybe not having enough to make it and have to rely on others? Is that, is that what God wants? You realize a king and his kingdom is judged by how, uh, how wealthy that kingdom is, how well he takes care of his, his subjects. In this case, we're children of the king. You know, it, it doesn't reflect good on our king if we're just barely getting by. So it's not God's will. That's my point. It's not God's will. God wants us to have the more than enough, the abundance for every good work. So we're going to share some truths here, things that we've practiced, things that we've walked in. Like I said, we've been uh, debt-free since 1997. Um, in fact, we've not had any financial challenges since 1997. I'm talking about personally. Now, when we merged two churches together back in 2009, Pastor John and Karen were part of that decision, uh, Prophet Larry Huggins, uh, Apostle Terry Mize, different ones that the Lord had connected us with. Uh, we merged that, and uh, there was about a six-month season after we merged those churches some of the uh, financial conditions of the church that we merged with were not disclosed to us, as um, we were led to think. But anyway, we found out afterwards that there was uh, some things that were hidden. Uh, so we were going through some financial challenges there. You know, I'm talking about with the church. And we, before that, our church was free and clear, or the church that we merged with this other church, and we had money in the bank. But it wasn't too long before we had, had uh, exhausted those funds. And Pastor Karen and John came out in October for the Billy Brims Conference. And Pastor Mary, who was kind of overseeing the finances, got with Pastor Karen. She said, I don't know what to do here. There's just not enough income to cover it all. Yeah, we weren't taking any salary, right?
Right. Nurture and admonition. Nurture and admonition right there. Yeah. Got us back on track. And after about six months, we've never looked back. We have an abundance now in our church financial situation as well. We just paid our, our we, we inherited a 400 and, I don't know, $420,000 mortgage when we merged these churches together. Our other building was free and clear that we uh, came from. And, um, again, that was some thing, there were some things in that mortgage situation stuff that wasn't disclosed to us you know we we took it on good faith but you know even even though that wasn't disclosed even though they weren't totally forthright in giving us all the facts we prayed about it we sought those that god had linked us with that were over us in the lord how many know that you're supposed to obey or honor or submit to those who are over you in the lord that's scripture amen hebrews thirteen seventeen. so we did that and they said well we believe that it is god so whether we knew it or not about these hidden things, it was still right to do it. And God was still faithful to bring us through, okay? And like I said, we just, we just paid down that mortgage, 225000 about a year ago, refinanced some, some bad finance term mortgage, okay, and got it at a lower interest rate. We will be free and clear in less, probably about four years now, if we just stay on schedule. We're believing it's going to be quicker than that. So God, and and there's, there's plenty of money in the bank. There's an abundance there for every good work, okay? So my, my point is, and again, I'm not saying this to brag on us, but bragging and boasting on God. There's a place where you can have more than enough, a place where you can have, and I'm not just saying a retirement nest egg, although I don't think that's, that's necessarily a bad thing, but an abundance for what? Every good work and charitable donation as the Lord directs you to give unto. Amen? So having that place, and I think... I think we can all, how many would just be honest, I, I can come higher in this. There's a higher place for me. I can grow in this. Now, there's not a whole lot of hands going up right here. I'm just telling you right now. Listen, if you don't want to, if you say, I really don't want to hear this kind of teaching, that's your prerogative. That's your prerogative. God won't force it on you. But it is our choice, and it is available. But you see, your attitude, our attitude, will determine our altitude. You want to know how high you can go? Well, it's all based on your attitude about it. Okay. And we sell those free of charge, free of charge, DVDs, audio. Uh, in fact, you can get it off our website, too.
will be three times as large as all the meat summer and winter day and night it can ever see. So it's a lot of it's really cool doing. Yeah. So we see right here at the very beginning, God is beginning to tell us there's going to be a principle that's going to be in effect from the time God comes on the earth to the day that Jesus comes back, and it's called seed time and harvest. Amen. Look at the end and say seed time, seed time and, and harvest. harvest. Yeah. It didn't just say seed time. No. Listen to me. It didn't just say yeah. seed time. Yeah. See, there again, I just feel that harvest. a lot of us that have been real good sowers, yeah. but we've been really lousy. I don't mean it's wrong, but God wants us not only to be good and aggressive in our sowing, Amen. but He wants us to be good and aggressive in our reaping. Uh-huh. Because that's when we make the promises of God destiny in our life. Amen. I mean, you want you want to talk about the, our brother was uh, last week, I guess it was uh, today. He was sharing about the, the spirit of Joshua and Caleb. You know, the spirit of Joshua and Caleb, that was pretty challenging. They hung around a bunch of people that didn't want to believe God for anything. Yeah. They had to hang around them in the desert, listen to them moan, groan, complain. Let me tell you something. If you're hanging around people like that, cut, get bait, get rid of them. You don't need them. They're going to hold you back from what God's got for you. Amen? And so they feel like unhappy people strolling around them. Amen? This is the point. But they, I, I wonder if they didn't kind of go out in the desert and hold some, some believers meetings where they kind of encouraged one another. Uh. Well, I hope God breaks me. That's what I'm doing. They weren't passive about it. There are too many people, too many Christians that are passive about their harvest instead of active about their harvest. Yeah, oh. aggressive. And 80 years of age, they didn't say, oh, well, God, if you want to give me something, come on, then it would be nice. No, they said, that's my mountain. Give it to me. Yeah, yeah. And when somebody else didn't want their land, they said, give that to me as well. I mean, they're 80 years old. They didn't ask, come on, for the flat land. They said, give me the mountain. Yeah, give me the mountain, Lord. It's my mountain. I'm going to take it. Why? Because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. We've got to develop that kind of a spirit. When God says something, bless God, it's mine. And I'm not going to settle for anything less than what Jesus paid for. Yeah. Would you go to the grocery store and leave half? Of what you paid for on the counter? Come on, let's all go to Walmart. Let's line up our cart. Let's get two cartfuls and let's only take one little bag out. Look at the day and say, that would be stupid. You got to say it with attitude. You got to say it with the same attitude she does, okay? Grace and the grace of 
will go faster than what the people are saying. Amen. Care what it takes. Yeah. That's right. Because I'm not leaving here without what God said is mine. That's right. It's going to be mine, and guess what? They got it. Oh, yeah. They got it. Yeah. 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 You don't have enough time to get it all in before the, the guy planting behind you or, you know, that, talking about sowing and reaping here. I mean, that's a time. God said the, the time will come. Why not now, Lord? Why not right now? Why not right here? Why can't that change now? I mean, is it going to be in the sweet by and by? No. No, it won't even apply there, folks. It applies here and now. But it takes us saying, you know, I'm going for that. I'm going for that. I'm going to aggressively pursue this. And expect it. You know, expectancy is key. And I mean, it's, expectancy and faith are so closely related, you can't hardly separate. You know, if you've really got faith, you've got an expectancy about you. I'm expecting it. And if your expectancy level is down here, that's what you're going to receive down here at this level. But if you'll get that expectancy up based on what the promises say, again, not just, not just something you come up, not some whim of yours, but something the Word promises, wow, there is no limit as to what God can do. You know, we just read there, and in, in Pastor Mary shared it here, about, um, about the seasons, you know, in Ecclesiastes there. In 2008, Pastor John, you probably remember this, but in 2008, May of 08, you guys were out in Sedalia there, and we hadn't merged the churches, so we were still over on the courthouse square there. But you prophesied, and Pastor Karen, you were a part of that too. You guys came up, you were tag-teaming, you know, as you often do when you minister and prophesy. But you prophesied to Mary and I, saying, you're coming into a greater season of harvest. This was 2008, May of 08. And so, of course, we received that word. Who wouldn't receive that word, right? That's a good word. An increased harvest season. So we expected that. We believed that. We began to declare that. How many know that prophecy, when you have a thus saith the Lord given to you, is not automatic? It doesn't just automatically happen because God said it. In fact, what, what did Paul tell Timothy, a young minister? He said, you need to wage a good warfare through these prophecies that are given you. In other words, there's going, to be, there's going to be some opposition to this thing coming to pass, and you're going to have to hold on to that word, not only the written word of God, but those spoken words, thus saith the Lord, those prophetic words, hold on to those, and when that opposition comes to make you want to doubt and say it's not happening and turn your, your mouth loose to undo everything God wants to do, you say, no, I, I received the word of God. That's my promise. I'm moving into an increased time of harvest. And see, that's what we're talking about, getting aggressive, guarding your thought life, guarding your speech, because they're connected together. You know, you think on it, you're going to say it. What's in there will come out, right? So it, all these are principles that are involved. And, and I know these are, again, basic faith principles, but, folks, this is the way God created it to work. We didn't set it up this way. We're just endeavoring to practice it. And I can tell you we've experienced some degree of success. And it's not just this arena, not just the arena of financial increase, but every area of our lives. It works. It works. That's what they thought it stood for. We, we said PKs, and they said, yeah.
for three weeks in a row. Amen. Amen. And it's fun. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 You, you need to tell your neighbor, get off the ropes and get out of the corner. Get back out in the ring and take that sucker down. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you looked at us, you would think I'd be the one with probably in more fights. I never was in a fight. I don't know because maybe I was, you know, good size or whatever. But she was, she was in a lot of fights. These aren't just little old, little old, you know, slap fights. These are, I mean, blood and fist and pulling hair and whatever else. <laughs> yeah. 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 He gets back up. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's right, under our feet. No, yeah, I'm, back to our testimony. Prophecy. Pro, remember, the, remember the story I was telling? Prophesied in, in May of 08. And then, <laughs> yeah, remember the screen, in focus, in focus. Uh, but in June of 09, this pastor of the Southern Church contacted us about merging these churches together, we becoming the senior pastors and so forth. We, we believe that was part of that harvest that you prophesied. Now, again, like I said, this happened in 09. There were some challenges. I already relayed with you about that. But we have seen increase every year in our business. We own a business. We actually own this business, started this business prior to becoming pastors in 93. We started this back in 1987. And in 2010, we began to, uh, well, we, we sensed and believed that the Lord had directed us to, to begin to bid public jobs, public offered jobs like schools, uh, prevailing wage jobs, what we call in Missouri. But anyway, we, we began to do that. Uh, uh, we have our two sons, two of our three sons are with us in this business, and, and they came into the business, you know, in 07. So we began to bid these jobs, and we got, we got two jobs that we bid, two out of three we bid that year, and our income doubled that year from, from the business. Uh, and it has increased every year. 2015 was our best year to that date. It doubled that year. It went from one six figure level to another six figure level in that year. One year. That's increase, folks. That's increase. And I, again, testimony after testimony of how God is increasing. You say, you know, well, you just got lucky. No, we got blessed. Didn't we read where God said, you know, in that Second Corinthians nine, that it's blessing, blessing? I don't, I, I don't consider lucky part of God's scenario. No, it's not a game of chance. It's not luck. It's blessing. Yeah, we just uh, last fall, well, let me back up a little bit. The, the business we founded in 1987 is uh, heating and air conditioning, electrical, and now we're doing a job where we're doing the plumbing in that too. So, But it's still public-related jobs. And, and here's the thing, and this, this is no pat on our back. We haven't had training for any of this. We didn't do apprenticeship. We just, we just went to the library and got a book. No, no lie. Got a book. And then we said, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. 
And God has directed us, and he's given us opportunity. Every favor and earthly blessing he is able to make abound unto us in abundance. That's the truth. That's the promise. But we've got to believe it, receive it. Someone said that last night. Receiving it, conceiving it. I mean, the way you said all that. Come on, you've got, you got to receive it. Be it unto me according to your word, O oh God, your rhema that you've spoken in our hearts. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Here's another cool testimony. In um, October of last year, actually I think it was the latter part of September, the two sons that are with us in our business also do organic farming on the side. You know, it's, it's not their main line. The, the business is the main line of income. But on the side, they do some organic farming. About 250 acres of row crop farming organically, so there's no chemicals involved. You know, all of the uh, fertilizer has to be organic manure, you know, and so forth. No, no ingredients or anything in there other than just uh, the natural stuff. Yes. Yeah. The Bible says this, if you will do what? If you will delight yourself in the Lord. Yes. He will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. So this is a way that God had of developing and giving them the desires of yeah. their heart. Go ahead. So they were looking for some way to control wheat. How many know that if you don't have any herbicides, they're going to have some challenges controlling the weeds, okay? So they found uh, online um, a machine that had been developed and built back in 1988, and then the company that developed it and began to build it went bankrupt in about 1990. So... Those units that were built, and I don't know what number were built, were off the market. There were just a few of them floating around out there. But the idea was there. And what it is, it's a machine that uses electricity to kill weeds. In other words, death to weeds through electrocution, okay? It uses electrical current to kill the weed. And uh, they found through, uh, really, I believe this was a supernatural thing, uh, a couple of brothers in Illinois that had built a similar unit. They just had one unit, this prototype unit. And these two brothers were um, uh, engineers. One was an electrical engineer, one was a mechanical. Anyway, they built this unit. And Ben contacted them by phone, our, our middle son. And uh, the man said, well, it's, it's interesting that you would call today. He said, we're getting ready to sell our unit, the only unit we have. We're going to sell it. We wanted to develop this into a business, but we don't have the time or the heart to mess with it anymore. So we were getting ready to sell this unit, and we're going to sell the, the patent rights and whatever that go along with it. He said, we were going to make our decision. We have four interested buyers. We were going to make our decision tomorrow. Would you be interested in possibly looking at this? And Ben said, well, yeah, we would be. So Ben came to, to me, and I, I shared it with Mary, and we prayed about it. And I said, yeah, I really believe this is a God deal. How many know what Deuteronomy 8.18 says? It is God who gives us the power or the ability to get wealth. Why does he do it? In order to establish his covenant in the earth. Amen? So I believe this is one of those opportunities. I said, I said, yeah, I really believe it's a God deal. I think we ought to pursue it. So they contacted him back said, yes, we are interested. So now we became one of five potential buyers after Ben shared with them uh, their heart, the fact that they were farmers themselves, and we wanted to develop this, this unit, make some modifications, and then market the unit. They said, okay, we choose you every earthly favor we choose you that's favor of god that's the favor of god that's the favor of god we choose you to sell the patent rights and here's listen to this you know how much money it cost us to buy the patent and the 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 right to to get this design and then modify it as we saw fit and go forward you know how what that how much that cost zero it's on a uh, royalty basis Every unit we potentially sell, we will pay them a percentage of that as a royalty. But it didn't cost us anything up front. Does that sound like God or not? So we, got the, we closed on that, that deal with them. We got the document, signed, contract, and all that. Like November 17th, beginning the 1st of December, we had a brochure made up, began to market that. To date, as of uh, last, in February actually, We've sold 11 units, over $400,000 in sales, and a good percentage of that is profit, folks. And we've only attended one show. Yeah, the one trade show with the thing. Listen, you say, did someone die and leave you an inheritance? Yes, yes. they did, actually. Yes. His name is Jesus. Yeah, 
Now that you mention it, we did have a rich, rich relative die and, and leave us an inheritance. In fact, I'm joint heir with him. Amen. How about you? Come on. Folks, we have a, a rich inheritance, and it includes these things. I think we might be out, what, is it pronounced Tulare or Tulare or whatever it is down here? This World Ag Expo or whatever they have. I came by that sign there yesterday, and I, I thought, I think we need to come out here to this thing. Another opportunity to visit our pastors in California, amen? But I'm just saying, God is so good. You say, well, you just, you just got lucky. You know part of our confession is? We are in the right place at the right time doing the right thing, always receiving God's best in our lives. See, the, things like that is aggressively reaping, pursuing, expecting what God has promised. And we could give you a lot of testimonies. Uh, every year, things happening like this, and God just keeps opening doors after door after door, and the harvest is coming in to the point where it's, it's challenging to keep up with us sometimes. But, oh, it's fun, too. It's fun. Amen. God wants us to live this way, not just have a, an opportunity every once in a while through some miraculous thing that happens. How many would rather live with, with blessing instead of miracle? Blessing is better because that's a continuous over and over and over, just a continuous thing happening instead of something happening in a time of crisis that is a miracle of God. Okay? Amen. Blessing is better. Praise the Lord. That is exactly right. So go with me to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 4. You want to read? 2 Kings chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3, if you don't mind, please. All right. Verse 1. Mm -hmm. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a little oil. And Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Okay. Amen. Now, this is the thing that I wanted us to see, because there again, we're going to try to go through a lot of scriptures, and we're going to try to get you where you cannot, I don't mean wrong, testimonies are great, they're going to inspire your faith, but what you need to know is how the rubber's going to meet the road, how do I do it, yeah. how do I get it, and so that's what we're going to try to get you to. So say amen, it's coming, okay? I want you to notice that first of all, that this man was, a, was in the company of the prophets, and it didn't make any difference who he hung around with, he ended up in the same situation. This is a point you can sit in this church and you can hear all the messages that you want. You can be around other people that are thriving, other people that have got a hold of the vision, but that doesn't mean it's going to fall on you. I don't mean this wrong, but it's not about who you are. Even though you are a child of God, it's not about that. See, there's so much of the time we're thinking, well, they're blessed or they're lucky or that's just the plan that God's got for their life. How many of you got some kids here? Do you want some of your kids to be losers? Do you want some of your kids to be bench sitters? Oh, yes, I want my son. He collected more splinters than all the other kids. Are you kidding? No, you want your kids to be out there. You want them to be on top. You want them to be successful. Let me tell you, that's exactly the way God wants you. He doesn't want any of you to be a wallflower. He doesn't want any of you to be a loser. He wants every one of you to be a winner in every area. I'm sorry, that's loser. I want you to be a winner in every area. God is good, okay. But it didn't matter if you sat there and you listened to good sermons if you're not doing something about it. Right. Now, I also want you to know that the devil hated them all. There was an attack on their life because the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. It wasn't God that brought calamity their way. So in other words, if this isn't God teaching you a lesson. This is the devil trying to hand you some defeat. See, but what he's going to say is, is that, well, it's God. It's God doing it. Because as long as you believe it's God doing it in your life, you're not going to resist him. You're not going to stop him. The Bible says if you don't resist the devil, he's not going to flee. You're going to have to recognize who's on your side and who's not on your side. If God be for me, see, you know the scriptures. It doesn't matter who's against you. If God be for me, who can be against me if God's on my side? Because God's not going to leave us or fail us. Isn't that right? But notice the next thing that the, the prophet said to her, he said, how can I help you? This is very important because God doesn't care if you haven't been doing things right all along. What God is trying to do is, how can I help you? 
I want to get you out of the situation. God isn't, well, you've made your bed. Now it's time that you lay in it. Next time, maybe when the preacher stands up to give you a good sermon, maybe you'll pay attention. No, God's right there to pull you out of the swamp. God wants to pull you. I'm coming, we all have some swamp dwellers. The sad thing of it is, some of us have been swamp dwellers. We've been willing to stay in there in the muck and the mire, and it's time that we come out of the swamp. Amen? So he says, what can I do to help you? Notice he doesn't even pause. He says, tell me what do, tell me what do, not to what does God have. See, we're looking here and we're going, God, don't you see the mess we're in? God, when are you going to do something about it? We need to recognize the reason we're in the situation we're in is because we created it. We need to learn to own our mistakes. Now, that doesn't mean that we get under condemnation about it, but we need to admit we've made a mistake and we're willing to make some changes. He said, what do you have in the house? In other words, God's saying to you, you're going to have to invest something in order to get out of this situation. You can't be passive. You're going to have to get active. Tag. I just want to reiterate a little bit, sorry, maybe give some clarification here. Notice how you we're saying that. We're in our, our situation because of our mistakes. Maybe not by your own doing directly, but you know, when we fail to resist the devil that's successfully, yep. that's a mistake on our part because we've been given the wherewithal to do so. So that's what we're saying. It's because of a, uh, the, the lack or the issue, the problem is not on God's end. It's on ours. How many would acknowledge that? The problem is not with God. It's something. So it, it, a wise person would say, God, where am I missing it? Not, what's wrong with you, God? How come you? Don't be like Adam. God is the woman you gave me. Either your fault or her fault, but not my fault. Come on. Own up to, yeah, I know somewhere the lack is on this end. The, the deficiency is on this end. It's not on your end, God. So show me where I need to make the adjustment. So she looks around and she says, I don't have anything except a little oil. See, that's just it. A lot of times we don't see the value in our seed. We don't see the value of what's in our hand. Because there again, you know, what was it you were telling me, honey, that whenever you plant, uh, anybody, anybody here do any farming? Well, let me kind of, I'm gonna, my husband and, and I used to farm, and I don't remember all the bushel, the acres. See, I was a city girl that went into a farm situation, and I did what the man told me. I learned how to get on that tractor. I learned how to plow. I learned how to cultivate. I learned how to do it all. You know what I'm saying? But but whenever you plant soybeans, how many bushel to the acre does it take of soybeans, and what is your harvest? Well, typically one bushel of soybeans plants one acre of, of ground. That's, that's pretty close to an average. So Maybe one bushel for that. one acre. Look yeah. at your neighbor and say, yeah. one bushel for one acre. Yeah. And that one bushel will produce uh, a good yield in our area of the country is about 60 bushel. So that's a 60-fold return. One bushel turns into 60 bushel, 60-fold return. Wheat is about the same way. One bushel will produce 50 to 60 bushel for a good harvest in our area. So about a 60, 50 to 60 fold return. Corn, a third of a bushel will plant an acre. And you can, so you can get three acres out of one bushel, and it will produce 100 to 150 bushel. It's a really good turn. That's up there in the, the 500 fold return or something, up above the, the 100 fold even. Yes. So let's look at a bushel basket. Imagine I have one here. You know, they're about, what, about yay big? One bushel basket has the ability to bring you in the harvest that you can rake over an entire acre. Now, this room isn't even an acre. Your potential is great with what you have. The devil wants you to see it as small. And what God is trying to get you to see is this has an ability to turn your entire destiny around. But you've got to see it of value. Because if you don't see it of value, it, it cuts its value down. Does that make sense? He says, what do you have in the house? She says, I don't have anything but a little bit of oil. And the prophet said, that's enough. That's enough. See, I don't mean it wrong. I wish the Bible gave us a, a full account of everything that happened. I would have loved to have heard what happened to the woman that only had two mites that put all that she had in. I would love to hear the Paul Harvey version of that story and hear the rest of the story. When I get to heaven, I'm going to find out because you're going to find out she didn't stay that way. Yeah, I agree. Isn't that right? Yeah, so he says, now, 
But I also want you to notice, what do you have? And she says, I don't have anything except a little bit of oil. Notice he says, go around and ask your uh, neighbors for empty jars and don't ask for just a few. So she does. Now remember, God is able, say with me, God is able able to do exceedingly, exceedingly, abundantly, abundantly, above above all all that I can hope, hope, ask, ask, dream, dream, or imagine imagine, according to the power power that's operating in me. What limited her harvest? Her ability to what she went out That's right. to gather in. It was really where her expectancy stopped. Her expectancy. Okay, sons go out. Okay, we got 100 vessels. Okay, that, that's, that's enough. That, that's good. Just stop right there. That's where her expectancy stopped. Because wherever the oil, when, when, it, when did she run out of oil? When she ran out of expectancy. There again, you're going to have to do some things to begin to stir your yes, expectancy. That's right. There are a lot of people that are hoping and wishing God would do some things, and they get a message on Sunday, and they think that's enough. Well, I don't mean it's wrong, but if I'm wanting to develop buns of steel, I'm not going to do a whole lot of ab, come on, exercises. I'm going to try to work in the area that I want. Isn't that right? We're going to do this thing. Come on, ladies. We know. We watch that and we watch little videos and we do the dance things. Come on. You know what I mean? And we're working on the area we're wanting to develop. Well, the same thing is true if you're needing to understand about finances. She said you, plain spoken, right? She said that earlier. Yeah. I did children's church kids like this. It's okay. <laughs> But if you're wanting to develop in an area and you're wanting to develop in your finances, you need to be listening to finances, not healing. You need to be listening to finances and not on righteousness. We're not saying righteousness is not needed. We're not saying healing is not needed. But if I'm trying to work in the area, I need to develop faith. Why? Because faith comes how? By hearing, not having heard, by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing of the word of God. You know, um, I, I wasn't really going to share a lot of this, but I felt like the Lord kind of stirred it up in my heart. Because I, I want to tell you, every one of us, it doesn't matter who you are, we all have the ability to say yes to it or no to it. And it doesn't matter what position or what grace you hold in the body of Christ. I get up every morning at 2 a.m. to trade what's called the London Open. I'm also a Forex trader. And you might say, why are you doing this? I thought you said that, that money is, is really not an object in your family. No, it's not. But I have dreams and goals. And one of my dreams is, is I'm going to give millions to missions. Yes, my husband is doing a wonderful job. He provides for us richly through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful for that. But I'm not going to be satisfied with just that. God told me to do this and I'm going to do it so every morning I get my rump out of bed at at actually five minutes till and I make my cup of coffee so I'm back there in my office with my monitors turned on at that time now at at that point some mornings I feel really good and other mornings is like oh God I wish you would have put somebody else on this vision come on anybody besides me ever been there now I can sit there in that stupid stupor Trading, having some success, and I'm going to say some success, but I have found that whenever I turn on to YouTube and I get me some good preaching, I get me some good teaching in that area. And I'm sitting there and I'm trading. But at the same time I'm trading, I'm listening to that word that's coming in. And my spirit's getting alive. And it's getting on fire. And I begin to operate in it. I'm going to tell you I come to a much higher level. I can start out at 2 in the morning. Usually I'll get an hour's sleep because I'm so excited for the markets to get up. Now, you can believe this or not, but my family can testify to it. I'll, I'll go to bed at 8.30, but I won't go to sleep till midnight or later. It just seems like I can't. I mean, I'm ready for the markets. I am ready. This is my harvest, and I'm going to have it. I'm like Caleb. I'm 80. You know, it doesn't matter. That mountain is mine. You give it to me. I'm thinking about those trades that's going to come about. So then I get to sleep just about the time for the alarm to wake me up. I grab my coffee, and I go into the other room. I start at 2. I usually get through at 2 in the afternoon where I might take an hour or two nap where I get to go minister to other people, and then I just start the whole thing over again. On Friday, I get to take a longer nap. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But this is the thing, I'm willing to pay the price. You might as well know something about life. If you're going to have a harvest, harvest is going to cost you something. You're going to find something that harvest is one of the most challenging 
times that there is. Come on, sowing, sowing, how easy was it to sow this morning where you came up and you put your offering in? Now, did you know that that opens the windows of heaven? That opens the windows of heaven and God is ready to pour it out. But how many of you have been receiving and walking in the fullness of what he's got? See, there's, there's another part of that, and that's called that aggressive harvesting. Even, even Prophet Huggins said the other day, see, this is it. Sometimes those that have went before us in faith, they know what to do, but it's been so simplified, and they've done it for so long, they forget to share with us all the steps. Yeah. And I don't mean that wrong. I find that with some of my trader friends that have been in it a long time, and then all of a sudden they'll foul up, and they'll give me one of those steps. You know what I do? I write it down. I want to make sure I don't forget any of those steps. And the same thing is true when I'm listening to those tapes. I begin to write some of these things down. Prophet Huggins says every morning before he gets up, in case you missed it, I get up every morning and I commission the ministering angels to go out. Come on. And to prosper my steps. Prosper. This is part of this aggressively harvesting. What we need to begin to say, what we begin to need to do, what we need to begin to put into action. I want you to notice, though, even though she had the oil. I didn't forget where I was in the story. Did you think I forgot? No. Even though she had the oil and she poured it into the vessels. Was that enough to get her out of her trouble? No. See, I don't mean it wrong. She still had not completed it she needed and she went back to the man of god and the man of god gave her the plan now what i want you to do is i want you to take the oil and i want you to go sell it and then i want you to go to dillard's and then i want you to go to kohl's and i want you to go to dress barn and i want you to and i want you to just spend it i don't mean this wrong but he who is faithful with a little will be made ruler over much. You want to talk about some faith principles. We've got to true prove ourselves faithful with what we've got. How many of you want some new things? Okay, how about a new car? Have you washed your car lately? Have you vacuumed your car lately? Have you checked the oil lately? Are you being a good steward of what God has given you right now? So, oh, you can see that. Okay, how about your bills? Are you paying them on time? Or are you going out and you're accruing new bills? See, there again, we've got to learn to be faithful. She took the oil, she sold it, paid all the debt off, and there was enough to live on for the rest of her life. So was sowing enough? No. She had to do something else to begin to reap, even like what we begin to share concerning uh, the the the... Whenever we merge the churches, actually, this started way before that. And, and there again, I'm going to try to share with you some stuff. We sowed some seed because we felt like the Lord told us way, way in advance, uh, long before the churches were ever thinking about merging. In fact, um, Pastor Pete Anson was the, the pastor at the time, and they were building on a new church, and we knew about it from the association. And so we gathered some of our guys, and we went over, and we helped them lay sheetrock on that particular area of property. And so then years later, whenever Pete Ansel was no longer the pastor, there got to be another pastor, his name was Jim Rutledge, and they were doing another add-on to their building. And there again, they were going to do uh, another sheetrock project. And so we went in again and got some more of our guys, and we went, and we went for, you know, there again, we weren't being paid. We went and just donated part of our time to, uh, to hang sheetrock. And in fact, I had to teach all the women how to do sheetrock. It was kind of funny. You know, and so we're teaching them how to do this. My husband and, and sons went in, and you guys, yeah, I knew you Let me say this that. now. Because we had people, when these churches merged, they said, well, and we shared this testimony. Did you intentionally go over and help them work on their new building project with the thought in mind, someday this will all be ours? No. Now, it was the furthest thing from our mind. We never even thought twice like that. Never even thought once like that. We went in there. We were thinking, though, let's go sow some seed. In fact, I remember telling the, the guys from the church, we're going to go over and sow seed because someday we're going to build a new building. That's where our vision was, our expectancy. We're going to build a new building, so let's get some seed in the ground so we'll have a harvest of help when that time comes for us. That was our sole intentional purpose. And also just to be helpful to our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
But when we went over and did that, again, the original part of the building that we're now in, we helped them hang sheetrock, we helped them put insulation in the walls, we helped them do some wiring, all this stuff, free gratis, just volunteer. Then the same way when they did the add-on, 3,000 by, well, 6,000 square feet, uh, we added, when they added that on to the existing building, the original building we helped with, same thing again. Helped them hang sheetrock, put insulation in, do some wiring, blah, 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 you know, a number of different things. So we went in there each time helping only to be a blessing to them, but also acknowledging and expecting a harvest off of this seed we were sowing. So when, when this merger came about, the name of our church is Abundant Harvest Worship Center. We, we changed the name from the church we pastored that we merged with this other church. We changed it, and that's a new, a new entity, if you will, now, a new name, because we said we want to make sure we have harvest in the name, because God has promised us an abundant harvest, and this is just part of that harvest. There again, I want, to come back, I want to come back to the principles. If you're writing down principles, number one, we sowed some seed. You will never have a harvest in any area of your life. If you want love, you must sow love. I know there are some people that are wanting a ministry. You want me to tell you right now how to make that ministry successful? Get plugged into the ministry that you're around right now and you be the best ministry of helps that you have ever, that they could have ever wanted. Because whenever you go into a ministry, you're going to need somebody to run the sound. You're going to need someone to help you carry the equipment. You're going to need somebody to do something. You need to begin to sow some seed right at the very beginning and you do that by being faithful where you are. Right. So say it with me, I got to sow. I've got to sow. And when we sowed, we had to recognize that our seed was good. Our seed was good. We recognized there again, we sowed into those ministries. We recognized it as a seed. We weren't just doing it to go to get a pat on the back from the other pastors, from the other churches. We were doing it saying, God, we recognize this is seed and that our labor of love, according to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 6, our labor of love does not go unnoticed. We sowed a seed and then we begin to call in our harvest. God, we thank you our seeds in the ground and we're calling in that building we're calling in that building. Now, you know something? They didn't just automatically give us that building right when we sowed that seed. It was years later that God began to work upon their heart. So there's seed, there's time. In other words, you got when you've done all the stand, you got up. Oh, see, we don't like that. We want the suddenlies. And yes, we're going to have some of those. But say it with me. When you've done all the stand... Stand there for. Why? Because it's going to come. It's going to happen. Then they picked up the phone and they called us and they said, do you want to merge the churches? You know, there, I knew in my spirit that there was more than what they were telling me. And so there was part of me that was a little uncertain. I mean, I knew that we were supposed to do it, but I could, you could just sit some headways. You know what I'm saying? So I had to get out of that uncertainty. We had to get into the plan of God, and we had to commit to following through. What I'm trying to tell you is that just sowing a seed isn't enough. Just making a few confessions is not enough. When God opens a door, you've got to be willing to go through, even though it doesn't all look like it's going to be cherries. And cast down the fear. That's right. Of the unknown. I mean, you're going and out there and you're taking a step of faith, and it may be a blind step of faith sometimes, but cast down those thoughts of fear. Pray, obey, get, make sure this as much as possible. Get that confidence in your heart. I believe this is the direction of God. And then just step out and there and walk it out. It's got to take commitment. You're going to have to get committed. Look at your neighbor and say commitment. Yeah, commitment. Amen. Committed. Now, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 10, it says this. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge your harvest of righteousness. Now, so that, in verse 11, so that you be made rich in every way and so that you'll be generous on every occasion and through your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Here we begin to see that God wants us rich so that we can be a blessing. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. To, be a blessing. to be a blessing. I'm not blessed to just hoard it up. Right. Though I am, to, notice what he said, he's going to increase my harvest of seed. 
So in other words, I am going to have some savings accounts. I am going to have some storage places. But it's not about just how much can I amass, but being ready to give anytime God's telling me to give and having enough to be able to do that. Can you say amen to that? But notice he said he will give you seed to sow and bread to eat. You know, I, I think this is, you know, gosh, there are so many scriptures and we're running out of time and I want to try to get us to uh, more of the harvesting. But you've got to begin to recognize when God puts something in your hand, is this seed to sow or is this bread to eat? I'm going to give you a quick testimony because I think this one will really help you to see it very quickly. Brother Jerry Savell, whenever he first started coming into ministry with Brother Copeland, he talked about that when he first got there, I mean, I mean right when he got there, he went out on a two-week stint with Brother Copeland. And he left his wife with $3. Three dollars to last three weeks. I thought I had it bad with ten bucks for two weeks. But, I mean, she had three dollars for, for, I mean, but at least she had more of the word in her than what I did at that time. But she had three dollars for three weeks. And so he went on, on this mission. In fact, Brother Copeland told him, he says, whatever it is you're going to get uh, to be paid, you're going to have to believe it in. Because right now the ministry doesn't have it. And so Brother Jerry was willing to, to, to go with that. And so they went out. And so she went to church that night. And, uh. You know, Brother Jerry's thinking the whole time, you know, what, how's Carolyn going to live with just $3? You know, I don't have any money to give her. In fact, Brother Copeland came back uh, within two days, and he told her, he said, uh, uh, I just want you to know that everybody got paid this week except you. I'm sorry there wasn't enough money in the budget to pay you. He says, have you been, have you been believing the, the finances in? And Brother Jerry goes, well, well, I thought I was. And so he says, but, you know, the Copelands, they were in this little bitty motel room, and, uh, and it was like paper-thin walls. And he said he was trying to be very conscious of, of Brother Copeland and, and Gloria over on the other side, and he didn't want to get too loud. He said whenever he was told that everybody got paid but him, he says he wanted to ask him, he said, did you get paid? He said, but he didn't. You know, because there again, we've got to honor the man of God. And so he went back to his room, and he began to confess the word. He began to get the word out. He put his, his, the word before his eyes. He began to speak it. He began to declare it. And you know something? The finances came in. But let me help you because let me show you where the seed got sowed. Sister, uh, his wife Carolyn, she went to church that night. She had $3. Now she's thinking, I've got to make $3 last two weeks. There is no way I can feed those children on $3 for two weeks therefore this cannot be food money this has got to be seed money look at your neighbor and say be able to distinguish between seed and food come on what's mine and what does god need me to show and so she sowed that night in the offering three dollars before she got home that night she was given thirty dollars which was enough to make it Come on, there was an abundance. You know, now, now that's starting out in faith. But you're going to have to begin to recognize, number one, your seed has value. Number two, is this something I'm supposed to plant? Where am I supposed to plant it? How am I supposed to plant it? But it doesn't just stop there. Because I want to tell you something the Bible talks about over Mark chapter 4. There's three times it says the kingdom of God is like. It's like a seed. It's like a seed. It's like a seed. Well, let me tell you something. We've done some farming. We've done some planting. And though I would have liked for that hay when it came time to harvest the hay, I would have really liked for that hay to have bailed itself up. I would have really liked that hay to jump on that wagon. I would have really liked for it to stick itself up in the barn. But I found out that the only way that harvest took place was for Mary to get on that tractor, for Mary and Tony to go out there, grab those hay bales, throw it on that, come on, throw it on that that, uh, that, that trailer, and then throw it from the trailer, throw it up into the barn, and we had to do that. We had to do the harvesting. We had to do the work. We have to harvest. You know, over in 1 Corinthians 6, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, 6, it says this, Apollos water, but God... Chapter 3, verse 6. Let me back up. I'm yeah. getting too fast. Yeah. Whew, sorry. I planted the seed, three. Apollos watered it, but God made, made it, it grow, grow or gave the increase. That's right. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Right. So there again, people want to say, well, see there, God's making it grow. Yeah, it says God made it grow. God makes it grow in the ground. If you go back over to Mark and look, let's look at verse uh, Mark chapter 4. 
and we're going to go, let's see, dee, 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 dee. Uh, it's 426, starting in 26 through 29. I'm trying to get us there because we want to get to the rest of that, and we are out of time, so I don't want, I don't want to overrun you. Mark chapter 4, starting verse 26, and he said this, this is what the kingdom of God is like. It's like a man who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and it grows. Say, God gives the increase. How many of you understand all that happens whenever you put the tomato seed into the ground? Mm -hmm. I don't. I understand that when that little sucker starts to come up, you stick the cage over the top of it. When it comes through there, you kind of feel, come on, you, 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 you put his little vines through there and you help it stand up against the wind. And if you have to, you even tie the little thing. I understand how it does that. I understand when the tomatoes get there that you've got to pick off some of the buds to make sure that, that you don't overload it in the tomato thing. But I also understand when the tomato gets good and ripe, that tomato doesn't jump from that vine into my kitchen. I've got to go out there and I've got to pluck the sucker. Isn't that right? So that's what this is saying here. All by itself, the soil produces grain. Say, no, God gives the increase. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle into it. He, who's the he? The man. That's you and I have got to start doing the harvesting. Some plant, some water, God causes it to increase. But if you and I want to harvest, we're going to have to start going and aggressively harvesting. Now, there again, I can't give you all the scriptures because we're just we're running way out, way too much out of time. One of the ways that you can do it, the Bible says over in Job 28, 22, that you shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto you. Isn't that right? Over in Isaiah 55. Let's look at that right quick. Because I want to I give you a, a couple of quick scriptures to go for it here. Uh, and I love this one. Yep. Back. Isaiah 55. And it isn't one to do it. That's all right. I remember where it's at. Tablets are good and all fun like that. But, you know, even if they glitch. You better have it in your head. You better have it in your heart. And then, man, now look here, Isaiah 55. Let's start here. Start in verse 4. See, I've made him a witness to the people, a ruler and a commander to the people. How many of you are called to be rulers? Come on, and commanders with Christ Jesus. Kings and priests. Kings and priests. Are. Sure, look at notice what it says here. Surely you will summon nations that you don't know, and nations that you know not will come running to you. Because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, has endowed you with splendor. Who called the nations? Look at the scripture here. The, the, the answer is not on my forehead. Yeah. The answer is in your Bible. You shall call them. You shall summon them. You know, if I had my little puppies in here, and I'd say, Smokey, come here. Come here, Smokey. He would run right to me. Because Smokey knows who his master is. Your harvest knows who its master is. But I've got to begin to summon it. And so I begin to say right now, Father, in the name of Jesus, I begin to call my harvest in from the north, the south, the east, and the west. I'm calling my harvest in on my family. My kids are coming into the things of God. My kids are going to walk worthy of their calling. You hear me, Alex, Lynn? You get to the place where God has appointed you. You walk in the things of God. You walk in the Spirit. Right now, I call in my harvest of finances. Now, this is how specific I get. Okay, I'm involved in a couple of trades. I've been in them suckers six months but I've been studying on how to get out of this thing I understand we all get into swamps but I ain't going to be no swamp dweller I'm going to be on top I'm not going to be below so I start saying GBP JPY harvest you come in GBP USC if you don't understand this is great British pound against the US dollar you come in I'm calling my harvest in okay so if you're involved in in football I call in those winds of football in the name of Jesus before that season begins. Winds, do you hear me? You come to me. You come to me in Jesus' name. Come on, bonuses. You come to me. Raises. You come to me right now in Jesus' name. Whatever it is you're believing for, you got to call it in. You've got to give it its destiny. Smokey might know he belongs to me, but he's going to piddle out there with every tree. He's going to piddle out there with every car tire. 
He's going to walk around in the grass until I begin to command him, you come to me. Our harvest has been piddling out there. It's time that we call it in. Now also, I'm, I'm attentive with God's voice. I'm beginning to speak things like, Lord, you said before things springs into being, you're going to announce it to me. So that means before somebody comes in for counseling, I'm going to know what the situation is before they even show up. I'm going to know how to attack the problem. But it also means when I get up at 2 a.m., I'm going to know what trades to get in. And when God says, leave that one alone, I know it's going to go against me. See, I'm beginning to get into the Word, and I'm applying my ear to it. Now, here's another testimony because of husbands and wives. Sometimes, you know, even with... Uh, my husband and I, when we preach and teach, we can become, even though we love one another's gifting, we can become threatened by one another's gifting. Can you say amen to that? If you can't, it's okay. You know, we all get delivered from some of this stuff. You can. You can become threatened by everybody that's around about you. Let me tell you something. The Bible says it's not wise to compare. Even if you're coming to church, sometimes another sister, maybe you're, you're kind of threatened by her gifting. Do you understand when God told them to go in and take the promised land, he didn't just say, Joshua, Caleb, you go take your promised land. It was a group thing. You need to understand something. We are stronger together than we are apart. The Bible says don't let the hand say to the foot, I don't need you. I need you and I need your gifting. I may not understand your gifting all the time, but I need it. I need to be there for you. I need to encourage you because there again, remember, what a man sows, he's going to reap. I'm plugging into her grace, and I'm going to receive from that grace. And I'm going to be there to help everyone take their ground. You know, uh, even my daughter-in-law, she got kind of started. Anybody hear this uh, Young's uh, oil stuff, you know, with the, uh, the healthy living, you know, the essential oils and different things like that? So, I mean, uh, Jessie's always been one of those that she didn't really like women going into business. She wanted just to be a stay-at-home mom, and there's nothing wrong with that. I support that 100%. I'm not one of those women, or I didn't think so, but now I'm at home more than anybody. But anyway, I always loved working with my husband. But, I mean, you know, now that she's kind of got started on the essential oils, she's like, man, I'm doing so good. I'm going to do better than Ben at the weed zapper. You know, this is his dream, but I'm going, I'm going to do better than him. That's dangerous. Stop it right now. Because what it is, is he's dividing you. It sounds cute, and it sounds funny. But I want to tell you something. The devil doesn't care. He's just trying to get in there to begin to weed it. Let me tell you something. I need to be praying, even though, yes, the, I, I will say this, you know, even though I've been involved with the markets, I'm like, God, I want to see this thing so successful. I want it to be where my husband, you know, if he wants to quit ACE, you know, that there's nothing there that we can just go and do. I mean, because we enjoy a, a nice lifestyle, and we don't want to give it up. I don't mean wrong. We're not supposed to give it up. We're not supposed to go down. We're supposed to go up. Can you say amen to that? And so, you know, there's sometimes I've gotten a little jealous about how they were doing. I'm like, look, God, I used to work with him, and I'm a hard worker. I work more hours than he does. I deserve it. No, that's not how you get it. The righteous will live by faith, not by whining. It's not off deserving it. It's off calling it in. You know, there was, uh, you remember Rodney Howard Brown? Now I'm going to quit here. We went to this, uh, there's so many scriptures, but we can't cover it all. There was this uh, um, revival that we went to, a brother Rodney Howard Brown's in, in uh, Oklahoma City. And they had these uh, guys from uh, over in Africa. Mari Bongwe is what I remember their name. And they, they sang Mari this. Bongwe. Mari Bongwe. And they had this, this great song. And it went like this, come to me, come to me. And he didn't do it this way, but they did it this way. And that's what we need to begin to do. Come on, folks. We've got to begin to call that harvest to come to me. Come to me. Come to me. Ooh, ooh, whatever it takes for you to get it in your head. But every morning, the Bible says, say to the mountain. I say to the problems too, get out of my way. Satan, you have no right to come against my harvest. In the name of Jesus, I cancel your assignments because the Bible says what is bound on earth is bound in heaven. What is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. So every morning I loose my harvest to come to me. I bind up the devil. Come on. I plead the blood of Jesus over it. Take these notes, folks, and start calling it in. 
Call it in. Let me say something concerning that. You got to start with sowing a seed, okay? I mean, you, I, that kind of goes without saying, we think. Yep. But you can't call in a harvest if you don't have some seed in the ground. Now, we're trusting, we're trusting that, that we're preaching to some givers here who knows that there's a difference between the tithe and the offering. We know that the tithe is the Lord that's holy and sowing seed is offering. We understand that, right? So you have to have some seed in the ground. A farmer that would think, I'm going to go out and harvest 50 bushels of wheat per acre this year and never plant the seed is a fool, right? You've got to have some seed in the ground. Start keeping track yes, of your seed, what you've sown. We were guilty of this for years. We were good sowers. Man, we were good givers. Pastor. We gave a lot of offering. But if someone would ask us, how much seed do you have in the ground? Oh, I don't know. Where, what ground do you have it in? I don't, you know, we, don't, we didn't keep track of it. We just did it. Pastor now, I, I know we were led by the Lord, but still, Pastor, we had to start take, keeping track of it. Pastor Karen called it bucket plunkers? Bucket plunkers. We were bucket plunkers. There you go. That was us. We were plunking in the bucket, but we weren't keeping track. So what we were basically no saying, without saying it, we were saying, it really doesn't mean that much to us. Let's just do it. We were not valuing the seed. Yeah, we weren't valuing the seed. We weren't. We were going through the process, but we weren't going to get a harvest at that. Does this make sense? We were faithful sowers. Oh, man. But we were very undiligent harvesters. We weren't keeping track. Any farmer that would do that in the natural that would go out and sow seed in specific fields. Maybe he has one crop here and a crop here and, you know, different crops in different fields. And then someone come along and say, what do you, what'd you plant this year? Oh, I don't know. You know, well, where'd you plant it? Somewhere, out there somewhere. You know, come on. And you think, well, what's wrong with this guy, man? He's off his rocker. If he doesn't know what he planted, where he planted it, uh, where, where, how are you going to harvest it? Oh, you know, I guess, I, you know, I don't know. And that's what we've been doing in the body of Christ. And yet Jesus is very clear in Mark 4, the kingdom of God works this way. It's like a man sowing seed. And it comes up, it produces fruit, and when it's ready, what? It's time to put the sickle in and bring in the harvest. Okay. So you keep track of it. You keep track of it. The second thing of it is, is that you pray and you water your seed. There again, that's not asking God, that's thanking God. Beginning to thank God that, that that seed is in the ground, that that harvest is coming, that we value it 100%. The next thing that we do after we, we, uh, we, we will begin to water the seed is that we also we got to pull out the weeds. That's getting rid of the doubt. That's getting rid of wrong confession. Right. That means you need at that point to keep your ear attuned to whatever area it is that you're believing your harvest for. Do not allow wrong thinking to come your way. Sometimes that wrong thinking can come through family members. You're going to have to tell them, I love you, I appreciate you, but I will not listen to this doubt in this area. God has promised me a harvest, and I'm going to have it. And they might make fun of you just a bit, but let me tell you something. They're going to start watching you. They're yeah. going to see yeah. if it yeah. happens in your life. Well, yeah. the Bible doesn't say arise and shine. From the prostration and situation, the circumstances arise because the glory of the Lord is going to be seen on to you. It goes on to say that nations will be drawn to the brightness of your rising. Right. They're watching to see, is God going to move for you? That's right. That's right. That's right. Keep your focus. In focus. In focus. Amen. Amen. Now, she said you, you can't allow thoughts to come. How many have found out you can't stop thoughts from coming? But how many have also found out you can do something about those thoughts? See, that's where it comes down to. You can't stop the thought from coming. Now, I don't, we don't advocate hanging around people that are going to feed negative, 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 you know, and always down your, your, uh, your faith in some way. We're, yeah, you don't need to hang around those. But you have to do something about those thoughts. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6.31, Take no thought saying. Don't speak it. Don't take that thought and make it your own. Cast down thoughts and imagination and every, everything that would exalt itself in the knowledge of God in Christ Jesus. Cast those things down. Deal with the thoughts. That's keeping the weeds out. That's keeping the, 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 the crop clean so you'll have a good harvest. Then uh, Brother Jerry shared this there again with me. I'm going to give you some uh, quick testimonies. You know, God inhabits the what? The praises of his people. Yeah. You want, how do you know what's going to get the 30, the 60, the 100 fold? You can increase your harvest by how much you praise him, by how much you love him, by how much you begin to glorify him. The more you do that, God's going to inhabit it. It's going to increase your harvest of righteousness that's going to come into you. Then call it in. Say, call it in. Be specific. Call it in because God's able to do it exceedingly abundantly, more than you could hope, think, ask, or desire, according to the power that's operating in you. 
And praise is not asking, oh God, please, begging God, oh God, please bring my harvest, oh God, please let it be a good harvest, but it's thanking Him. Most, most of our praise should be affirmation of what He's already promised. God, I thank you for a bountiful, bountiful harvest. I thank you. I've sowed bountifully. You promised I'm going to reap bountifully. I thank you for that harvest. Again, praise, thanking Him for what He's already promised we will have in line with that word. Amen. That's impro- Again, sometimes we get over that line. We're, we're trying to beg and plead and ask God to do something He's already promised He would do. So our approach should be, our position should be one of thanksgiving instead of asking Him to do it. He's already promised He would. Thank Him for it. That's the right kind of praise to do. Amen. You know, I'm going to come back. You remember um, Pastor John shared it this morning in Luke chapter 5. We talked about that Peter loaned his boat to the master. He sowed a seed. He sowed a seed. His labor of love did not go unnoticed. After he sowed the seed, then the Lord said, launch out into the deep. Let me ask you something. Did Peter have the right to tell him no? Yes, he did. I'm going to share that scripture. Yeah, I got one more there that I'm going to share he he uh he said launch out into the deep he had the right to ignore the master did god have a blessing that was exceedingly abundantly above all he could hope ask or think waiting for him if he didn't get it whose fault would it have been you have to then be willing to step out and do what looks like it's impossible for you to do The devil's always going to talk to you about your limitations, about your insufficiencies, about how you're not qualified. But that's when you have to remind him whose I am. I am in him and he is in me and greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I have been redeemed from the curse. I thank you that the spirit of the Lord is resting upon me. It is the spirit of wisdom and of understanding. It is the spirit of counsel and of might. And I don't judge by what I see with my eyes. I don't judge by what I hear with my ears. But I judge by what God is leading me by my spirit. That's Isaiah 11 in case you're curious of where that's at. And I begin to call in my harvest. He had to go out there. And then the Lord told him, he says, now throw your net over on the other side. You might as well know you're going to have to get invested twice. You're going to have to sow the seed, but you're going to have to be invested to collect the harvest. But I want you to notice what happened. God brought them in. So much of a harvest. It was a net-breaking, boat-sinking type of experience because God is wanting so much to show you How his grace is going to lift you out of the swamp. Are you willing to launch out into the deep? Did you know that God doesn't have just the harvest that you've sown? Let me show you one more scripture. If your fire hasn't been lit by here, how many of you had some some, uh, family members that were Christians that maybe sowed a lot of seed, but they never got a harvest? How many of you know that that's still seed in the ground? How many of you know it's there? How many of you know it's yours by inheritance? Have you got a scripture on that? Go with me to Mark chapter, I'm sorry, John chapter 4. John 4, 34 and 30, uh, 36, and I'm going to read 38. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Do you know that's what we're supposed to be doing is we're about reinforcing God's finished work, Jesus' finished work. He said, do not say four months and then the harvest. Now, I want you to remember, Jesus said this in his day. Don't say four months in the harvest. He said, look out there that the fields are white. Why wasn't the harvest coming in? Because no one saw the necessity. He said, pray that the Lord of harvest will force, force, thrust them, force them out in the harvest field. I'm praying that God is going to start forcing you out to get your harvest in. I don't want you to be lacking any good thing. Now, going down to verse 38, look at here, it says, I sent you to harvest. Listen to this. I sent you to harvest what? Where you did not plant. Others have already done the work now. You will gather in that harvest. 
So, Father, you know, I thank you that my grandma and my grandpa, they were great sowers. And so was my daddy. And they went on to be with heaven. Well, God, my brother don't believe this, so I'm going to get his half too. So, Father, I just call in that harvest. It's mine. You come into me in the name of Jesus with that seed. That seed has been sown. It was in good soil. And I thank you now. Father, I am blessed to be a blessing. I'm asking you now in advance. You show me where to invest it. You show me what to do with it. Lord, I'm thanking you right now that you have given me the power and the ability to get wealth in order to establish your covenant. Father, when they see me, let them see you. Lord God, Father, you are my God and there is none like you. How many of you can start becoming aggressive harvesters? Hallelujah. Harvesters of of finances and souls. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's do this right now together. If you have seed in the ground, I want you to do this from your heart right now. Say, in the name of Jesus, Jesus, by that authority, I speak to my harvest. Harvest, you listen to me. In Jesus' name, come to me right now. Come to me right now. I speak to the north. I speak to the south. I speak to the east. I speak to the west. Give up my harvest. Give it up now. Come to me now. In Jesus' name. Oh, I apply the blood of the Lamb over my harvest. It's mine. Come to me now. In Jesus' name. Yes, favor. Favor. Yes, favor. Blessing. Empowerment to prosper. Hallelujah. 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 I mean, every time it comes to mind... Do, just go through that. I mean, talk to it with the authority of Jesus' name. Command it to come. Bind up the enemy. Command every hindering force to be removed. Cast out in Jesus' name. Exercise that name. We've been focusing on that in these worship services. The name, the name, the name. Come on, God's been speaking to us about that. Amen? Hallelujah. Aggressively harvest it. Don't lose track of it. Expect it. Expect it. And we'll see God fulfill his word in our lives. Amen? Hallelujah. God bless Pastor John, amen. Praise the Lord. Be seated one more minute, please. Well, more than one more minute, but... When I walked, when Karen and I walked into this town in 1983 and obeyed the Lord to pioneer a church here, the Lord spoke to me at one point, and he said, do not let the spirit that's on this city right now get on you. And I'm like, whoa, what spirit? What are you talking about? And he said, Poverty. He said there's a poverty mentality that is ruling over the city. And he said it produces, you know, poverty doesn't just produce, you can't pay your bills. It, it causes people to have disease because they don't eat right or they can't get to the doctor because they don't have, you know, you just, you can tie poverty to every kind of evil there is. It produces a love of money, which produces a lot of other things. And so he dealt with me about that, and he told me. And I'll I'll be honest with you, there were times when I had to, I realized I had slipped into a thinking that was wrong. And then I found that looking at national statistics that the Central Valley and the the, uh, Mississippi River Valley were considered at that time at least, I don't know what it is now, the two poorest areas in California, or in uh, the United States, poverty-wise. And so, uh, you know, you could see the enemy was working here. So we had to make a decision, and, uh, and we've stood, and we've watched God, you know, help us, and we have been in that get-by, you know, just enough stage. And, of course, you know our testimony, if you've been around here very long, how that back when the uh, economic thing happened in 2007, that we uh, went through a period of about four years where we had to believe God week to week to keep our head above water, and twice during that four-year period or so, we came to the end of the month, and we were $3,000 short both times of just paying our bills. And God was faithful, and he brought somebody in with $3,000 that didn't even know what was going on to hand it to us so that, you know, that made up the difference. But then we, we remembered a prophetic word that a prophet by the name of Larry Huggins gave us. Anybody know Larry Huggins? In 1998, now we're talking 2010 now. And we had, we had uh, received it, and we rejoiced over it, but we put it away. We had the prophecy in the files, not in here and not in here. 
And my wife remembered it. She got it out. It was a prophecy about the angelic. It was a prophecy about an angel over this church that was here to prosper and cause people to flourish. You see, where sin abounds, where darkness abounds, grace and light much more abounds. And so we got that prophecy out. We read it, and Karen said, Lord, this, I believe this, the, the prophet's word. I believe this is true. But at the end of the prophecy, it said this. It's Larry said, now you can take this and you can hang it on the wall and some language along that, that line. And everything in that prophecy we had done except that last part. So we duplicated that thing and we hung it on the wall. We put it on the doors. We put it in the bathroom. We put it all over this place. And why? Because we wanted people to see it and begin to decree it and receive it and begin to reap what the prophecy said. And on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, which I thought was pretty prophetically uh, interesting anyway, the 10th anniversary of 9-11 on a Sunday night, just a normal Sunday night service, the, 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 uh, there were some people walked in the door that didn't even go to this church. They had a relative in this church, but they didn't go to this church. But they would come just every now and then they would show up. They came in, long story short, they gave us a $90,000 check. $90,000 check. Why? Because we started calling in the harvest. We believe the prophet, and we begin to receive by doing what the prophet had said. And so what you've heard today is very important for you. It's not about setting you up for an offering. You know we're about to receive a love offering here for our guest speakers, but it's not about setting you up. And if you feel compelled today, don't put money in the offering because you're going to need it. Don't give out a compulsion. You give because the Holy Spirit's working in your heart and, and what he's saying to you. But I can tell you this right now, that the anointing of God is upon them for what they've shared with you today. That This is not just something they wanted to talk about. God has not only anointed them with the understanding, he's working it in their life. And, you know, if I want to be a baseball player, I'm not going to go find some guy that looks like me and learn. I'm going to find a pro player that knows it all so that I can, you know, get from him what works? And these two have, have proved it in their lives. It's working in their lives. And today, the opportunity for some people in here to have the spirit of poverty broken off of their life, it's right here, right now, today. It is. It is. And if you'll take hold of it, see, just like when Larry, Prof Larry Huggins prophesied to us in 1998, if we would have grabbed that and done with it what we should have done with it, from the very first day, we might not have even never had to go through that thing in 2007. Amen. God might have got enough money to us ahead of time. It wouldn't have matter what the stock market did in 2007. So instead of us having to, like, like Mary was saying earlier, I think it was Mary, from living a miracle to miracle, let's step into a blessing mode. Amen. So go ahead and pass out the offering envelopes. You just lift your hand if you need one and i just want you to pray and talk to god and say lord what do you say to me about this what have you said see some of you already in here you heard some things and this is not just about money it's about your children it's about your heritage hebrews 11 i read that chapter totally different than i've ever read it before it's a it's a spiritual heritage for me and it, i'm connected to it i'm in the storyline right now isaiah 51 God tells the children of Israel, he says, consider Abraham and Sarah, the pit from which you were digged, the rock from which you were hewn. He says, I called them alone, I blessed them, and I increased them. And that's what we're made. In other words, he was telling the children of Israel in Babylon, here's what you're made out of. You're not some refugee reject having to live in Babylon and miss God, what God has for you in your heritage and in your place in Israel. He said, you're made out of the same stuff Abraham was made out of. And if you'll take hold of that and believe it, I'll do the same thing for you I did for him. I'll call you, I'll bless you, and I'll increase you. God's end increase. Amen. So, Father, right now we come before you. Thank you for having Tony and Mary, pastors Tony and Mary, preach on this this morning. God, it's so easy for us sometimes just to get into a mindset. And I thank you, Father. This is the missing link, aggressive harvesting, and we are in a harvest season. I've heard all the prophets talking about the evangelistic move that's coming. 
and all the harvest that's coming in. Dear God, we're in it right now. We're there. And if we'll just start reaching out, we'll not only harvest money, we'll harvest people. We'll have things, God, from our heritage come down the line and have it in our day so that we can be blessed to be a blessing. Thank God that you, if you can get it to us, you can get it through us to other people. And we make a decision right now. We're going to live our life blessed to be a blessing. And so right now we agree with what they just said. We call in that harvest. We say, come to us. God, we honor your angels. We thank you that your angels are going out. And they're making connections for us. They're causing us to be blessed, Father, to have the favor of God upon our lives. We thank you, Father, that there are people in here that their circumstances and their situations are turning around right now because they're like that widow. They're going to reach out and they're going to take hold of what they need to do in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Just go ahead and receive the offering. Hallelujah. Glory. Don't you get tired of just running in a circle? Don't you get tired of just, it's the same old thing? A rut? Somebody said a rut is a grave with both ends knocked out. We got to get out of that rut. Get out of that grave. Amen? Glory to God. Well, this is a radical church. That's right. And it's going to get more radical. Somebody's got to break the mold. Somebody's got to press through the barrier. Somebody's got to show people that God is real and that there's a different way you can live your life. Why not us? Why not us? Hallelujah. We're bursting out. Amen. Breakthrough. Keys to the kingdom. Go ahead and let's stand up. Glory to God. Wow. This has been good this weekend. If you missed the other services, I feel sorry for you. You can get it on the CDs if you want, though. Praise God. And on our uh, YouTube channel, right, Ron? YouTube channel? It will be put on YouTube, our YouTube channel if you want to watch it. Amen. It's on Facebook Live right now. Okay. Praise God. Tonight, everybody say 6 o'clock. Brother Tom Terry, the wild man from Wisconsin, is going to be ministering. So you know how that goes. <laughs> He told you this morning it's going to rock? Okay. It's going to rock, whatever that means. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, really. So we're going to have a great time. And listen, I'm telling you, and I, I mean this seriously, we're having fun, but if you know somebody that's got demonic problems, bring them tonight. If they're under depression, oppression, they're obsessed by something, or they're just flat-out demonized, bring them. I mean it. Tom has an anointing on his life. God has just used him this way ever since I've known him to break the power of the devil off of people's lives that have those kind of situations. And so if you know somebody that really needs to come out of depression or come out of something, just tell them, come to church with you tonight. Let's just get prayer together. Amen. Lord, thank you for all you've said to us, shown us, revealed to us, and done in our midst this morning. We thank you, Lord. We know that tonight is going to be the grand finale of this time together and we expect you to be who you are in a great and a mighty way we bless your people we thank you that as they go they go rejoicing they have a good afternoon of rest and they come back tonight ready to worship and praise you with all of their hearts in jesus name amen have a good afternoon god bless you